Good morning, all, and thank you very much for the invitation to be to speak to you this morning. And I'm sorry I can't be with you uh, in person, as this is rather much a second best. Teresa Schaefer asked me to say a little bit about who am I. Well, I'm an Australian, which you, I'm sure you've realised from the accent, who came to Oxford in 74 to take up the Nuffield Chair of Surgery. And in 75, I founded the Oxford Transplant Centre. So that's the, the background about who am I. Um, I was, had, by the time I retired from the chair in 2001, I'd been 28 years in the chair and as director of the Oxford Transplant Centre. I then, much to my surprise, was elected as president of the Royal College of Surgeons of England in 2001, which I did for the next three years. This is a very uh, political post, uh, apart from being involved with surgery and education of surgical trainees, and I met regularly with the Prime Minister, the Secretary of State for Health, and the Chief Medical Officer, uh, to mention but a few. However, I did uh, chair a working party on organ transplantation, which made a lot of suggestions, which the government accepted in whole, and I was able to secure funding for specialist units in pancreatic transplantation and pancreatic islet transplantation. But then at the end of the presidency in 2004, what then? I should remind you that it's not possible to continue operating after the age of 67, and I felt it was inappropriate to go back to laboratory-based research. Evidence-based medicine was beginning to emerge, and of course, in Oxford, we've been stimulated very much by David Sackett, the father of evidence-based medicine, who had been appointed a couple of years earlier to the first chair in evidence-based medicine at Oxford University. Well, I was having coffee one day with Ian Chalmers, who was responsible for the establishment of the Cochrane Library, and he suggested that I might uh, start looking at evidence in transplantation. And then I got a small grant to establish a Centre for Evidence in Transplantation, uh, which started up in 2005. And it had two main roles, as I saw it. One was to evaluate available evidence in organ transplantation by way of, for example, systematic reviews. And secondly, to establish a database of all randomised control trials in transplantation. And it's worth drawing your attention to a quotation from the famous Archie Cochrane in 1979. It has been remiss of the medical profession that they had not developed specialist libraries of all RCTs in their discipline. Bearing in mind he made that statement in 1979, the transplant library is now the first such specialist library uh, some 30 years after that keynote uh, lecture. Another quote that's important in the context of the Transplant Library is an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine around 2005 that there are very few humans on the planet capable of searching the medical literature using mesh terms. Hence the idea of a database of library uh, or library of all RCTs in organ transplantation including conference proceedings. Letitia Barcina and Lizette Pengel worked for two years to produce the database. It was first published in the journal Transplantation, then online on the Ovid SP platform, where it still is today. In 2004, from then on, we added an assessment of the quality of randomised controlled trials. Uh, this is very time consuming, and so we couldn't go back in retrospect to trials earlier than that. And then from 2008, we added selected good quality systematic reviews. The Ovid SP platform is quite rigid, and so we've begun a new collaboration with Evidentia Publishing. And you're going to hear about that from the CEO, Mark Sregada, shortly. The Evidentia Publishing Company specializes in databases related to evidence and the Transplant Library is the first such database they have taken on. The beauty uh, of uh, this uh, database and the platform it uses 
is that it can be customised for individual users. We have much more flexibility. In addition, the Centre for Evidence and Transplantation does produce the Transplant Trial Watch on a monthly basis, listing 10 trials of general interest that have been added to the library in the past month. It's produced every month and it's available on Android and um, the Apple um, uh, platforms and is free. The Transplant Library is now spreading quite rapidly. It's taken by the European Society of Organ Transplantation, the British Transplantation Society in Europe, for example, uh, in the Middle East, the Middle Eastern Transplantation Society and the Turkish Transplantation Society both take the library. Across the pond, the Canadian Transplant Society and the Brazilian Transplant Society also take uh, the library and numerous institutions around the world also subscribe to the library. Um, I think at this point it is appropriate to say that the Texas Transplant Society is the first in the USA to take the library, another first for Texas. So in conclusion, thank you for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about uh, the library. And again, I'm sorry I can't be with you, but I do want to say a little bit about our future plans, which are to expand the library to include uh, cohort studies, case studies, uh, and observational studies, so that the library will be the first port of call for everyone, be they clinician, nurse, uh, scientist, working in the field of transplantation. Uh, the transplant library is, I think, the first in the field, it will be the first of many, in my opinion, because it's easy to search, easy to use, and you don't need any sophisticated uh, training in searching the medical literature. So again, uh, thank you again for your attention, and can I wish you a very good meeting and again, I'm sorry I can't be there. Thank you.